Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, uh, March 21st, 2021. I'm your lay reader, Zach Cosner. Um, I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link in the description under this video on Facebook and on YouTube. You can also find it on our website, www.centralprespb.com. Look for the publications link, scroll down till you see today's date, and then you can um, click on that link and it'll download the PDF for today's bulletin. You can read that on a mobile device or a tablet, or feel free to go ahead and print it out so you can follow along during today's service. I wanna apologize. I am dealing with an upper uh, um, a head cold essentially. Um, so if I'm going through this a little fast this week, um, it's because I'm trying to get through it. Um, so, and I'll also my you'll hear my voice is a little weird this week. Um, but now that you have your uh, bulletin, I ask you ask that you turn your attention to the announcements found on the last page of the bulletin. Uh, we will be holding an egg hunt on Palm Sunday in front of the youth building at 1 p.m. Um, if we get a lot of rain this week, uh, it will be canceled. Um, it will not be rescheduled or taken inside in case of a bad weather event. A decision on how wet the ground will be um, you know, besides, you know, rain day of, will be made later this week and will be announced on social media. Um, uh, we are continuing to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Uh, when we make a decision to change that, um, uh, keep in contact with us via social media and we will announce um, any changes there. A uh, username is Central Prez PB. If you're looking for uh, any services that you may have missed, you can check our archive on our website um, which will provide links to our Facebook and our YouTube pages. Our website is www.centralpresspb.com. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. I am doing a new thing, says our God. We will answer God with new hearts. Seek me and desire truth and mercy, calls our God. With our whole lives, we will hear God's voice. If a grain of wheat dies, it grows into new life, promises Jesus. We will seek to let go and to grow deeper into faith. If you wish to follow me, become servants, Jesus tells us. We will live a life of service following him. <clears throat> Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Let us ask God forgive us. First in unison, using the prayer printed in the bulletin and then silently. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now let's go ahead and turn it over to, uh, for this week's children's sermon to Rose Von Tunglin. Good morning, everyone. Today I thought we would talk about helping hands. You know, when you were little or smaller, you were probably needed some help doing things. You probably needed help tying your shoes, maybe pouring a glass of milk, um, putting your clothes on. And who helped you with those things? Of course, your mom or your dad. You may have even had to have time to help uh, riding a bicycle or jumping on a trampoline. But anyway, your mom or dad probably or more than likely helped you with that. Today, I want to tell you a story about the time when Jesus helped one of his disciples. They had been out on the mountain all day long 
Jesus was preaching and teaching and healing. And the disciples were watching over the crowd and feeding the crowd. And it started getting a little dark. So Jesus told the disciples to send everyone home. And that he was going to go off by himself for a little bit and pray. For them to get in the boat and go ahead and go over to the other side of the lake. So the disciples did that. They got everybody to go to leave. And Jesus went off by himself to pray. And they got on the boat. And as they got on the boat, you know, it got night time. And they were crossing the sea and, or the lake. And a storm started coming up. And the wind started blowing. And they had been on the boat long enough that it was just starting to get daylight. And they looked across the ocean or the lake and they thought they saw a ghost. And then Peter, who was one of the disciples, said, No, it's Jesus. And look, he's walking on the water. So Jesus, you know, waved to him and told him everything was going to be okay. Well, Peter wanted to know could he come out and meet Jesus on the water? And Jesus said, Sure, come on. So Peter got out on the water and started walking across the water, just like Jesus was doing. But the storm started getting a little bit worse, and Peter started looking around and looking down and like, oh no, so he started sinking. But Jesus held his hand out and said, here, take my hand. If you had kept your eyes on me, you wouldn't have sank. And that's what we need to remember. That we always need to keep our eyes on Jesus to help us through hard times and to be with us during good times. And this week I want to especially say a special prayer for Dominique who will be having surgery tomorrow. Let us think about him and may he keep his eyes on Jesus also. In Jesus name let us now pray. Dear God today we thank you for always being there to give us a helping hand. Help us to remember to always keep our eyes on you and be with Dominique and the doctors and the nurses who will be taking care for, of him this week as he goes through surgery once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Rose. We appreciate that. Um, now let's go ahead and turn it over to this for this week's sermon, uh, The Meaning of Life and Reverend Timothy Reeves. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from the 31st chapter of the prophet Jeremiah, beginning with verse 31 and proceeding through verse 34. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. <clears throat> no longer shall they teach one another. Or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the head or from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We turn now to our second reading <clears throat> from the 12th chapter of the gospel according to John, beginning with verse 20 and proceeding through verse 33. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, 
Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O oh God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Albert Camus once observed that we humans are creatures who are, or who spend our lives trying to convince ourselves that our existence is not absurd. And when you really think about it, that's a rather sad commentary on human existence. As we noted last week, many of us do not see that we all have inherent value, a value based on the truth that we are created in God's image. Too often in this world, if we can see neither the value in ourselves nor in our neighbor, then we can and do often resort to building ourselves up by tearing others down. But last week, we learned that we are what God has made us, that we are God's masterpiece. And as such, God puts us on display for the entire world to see. Now, that means more than just standing here and looking pretty. We learned that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. And this week's readings from Scripture build on that truth. In our reading from John's Gospel, Philip is approached by some Greeks who make the request, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And it is not known whether these were Greek-speaking Jews or whether they were Gentiles who were God-fearers, meaning that they were drawn to the Jewish religion but had not yet been circumcised. Nor is the exact nature of their request clear. That's because in John's gospel, words often have a deeper meaning. Seeing is one of those words because it often carries with it the connotation of believing. 
So in one sense, these Greeks may have simply been caught up in all of the excitement of the moment and wanted to get a glimpse of one whose fame had preceded him. Because just prior to this request, John has reported that Jesus has entered triumphantly into Jerusalem. And just prior to that, John had reported how Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And fame can be rather intoxicating, not just for the one receiving the attention, but for all who come in contact with that person. So it would stand to reason that they would want to see Jesus. But another possibility, and the one that I personally am more inclined to favor, is that these Greeks were requesting to become disciples to believe in Jesus. Because earlier in John's gospel, Jesus said, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my vo voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. But ultimately, who these Greeks were and what exactly they meant by their request really matters very little because as quickly as they appear, they disappear from the scene. In fact, the statement, we wish to see Jesus, is followed by Jesus's self-revelation. And that revelation comes in the discourse that he has with his disciples. In this passage, Jesus's words, <clears throat> to Philip and to Andrew, carry much the same meaning as Jesus' rebuke of Peter at Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because Jesus' message does not center on the accolades or on the grand parade, but rather on the true nature of his existence. Sure, the world heralds a conquering hero, but Jesus quickly points out that this is only smoke and mirrors. To get caught up in the frenzy of enthusiasm is to miss the, the entire point. Because the world is far too fickle. Today's hero is forgotten tomorrow. And certainly Jesus understood that better than anyone. The very crowd that would cheer his approach to Jerusalem would scream for his death in just a few short days. His words made clear in no uncertain terms that his hour of glorification had absolutely nothing to do with the world's notions of glory. Glorification hinged on him being able to draw the world unto himself glorification manifested itself in bearing fruit. Oh, it must have been tempting to yield to the crowd's applause. Even Jesus gives us a hint at that when he says, now my soul is troubled and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus knew that to yield to the crowd would mean to fail in his mission to reconcile God and humanity, to defeat once and for all the power of sin and death. So to truly see Jesus, we must move beyond the smoke and mirrors and empty praise we must forget about all human notions of pride and glory and honor and embrace the shame and ignominy of the cross. Philip and Andrew seemed to have lost their focus. They had become intoxicated by fame. And by being recognized as Jesus' followers, they enjoyed a great deal of fame themselves. The opposite would also proved to be the case, because as soon as Jesus's fame turned to notoriety, and as soon as the authorities had him in custody, they would flee. They would distance themselves from Jesus 
all too quickly. And like all the other disciples, Philip and Andrew failed to grasp Jesus's point. His hour of glorification would be his death and resurrection and ascension. That's why the word of God had become flesh and lived among us so that when he was lifted up, he might draw all people to himself. And it's with that understanding that Jesus uttered the words, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth or into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, I'm sure we have very little trouble understanding those words. But what Jesus said next is far more difficult to understand. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world keep it for eternal life. Hating our life hardly falls under the category of viewing ourselves as God's masterpiece, does it? And focusing solely on eternal life has caused problems as well. What use are we if we are so focused on heaven that we are of no earthly good? That type of skewed thinking is exactly what led Karl Marx to conclude that religion is the opiate of the masses. But Jesus had something very different in mind when he uttered those words. And what he had in mind gives life meaning. First, when he alluded to hating one's life in the world, he was not arguing for us to view our lives as some sort of detestable and vile thing. Just the opposite is true. Life is a gift from God, and Jesus had said in the 10th chapter of John that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But life in this world is the height of absurdity from God's point of view. Life in this world is governed completely or by completely different standards than what life in God's realm is governed by. <clears throat> what we think gives life meaning in this world holds no value whatsoever in God's realm. And what we so easily cast off as unimportant are oftentimes the very things God values most of all. Things like love, justice, and humility, for instance. The meaning of life is found not in the pursuit of more, but in the self-emptying love exemplified by Jesus Christ. And those who hate such self-centered life in this world are able to keep their lives for eternity. But in John's gospel, eternal life is never just limited to pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. Eternal life has a very present dimension as well. Because as much as we look forward to a future dwelling place in God's house, we are also to manifest here and now a life lived in God's presence, in how we love God and neighbor and self. In short, then, eternal life encompasses everything that Jeremiah envisioned when he said that the days are surely coming when God would write God's law on our hearts. It means that we will live as God wills us, not because we feel obligate, obligated to do so, or are afraid that God might judge us if we don't, but rather because doing so is the height of joy and gratitude for the blessings God has bestowed. Joy in the presence of our creator, sustainer, and redeemer is what gives meaning to our life. So the question before us is, why would we ever be content to settle for anything less? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen.
I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which again will be taken electronically this week. I ask that you head to our website, www.centralpresspb.com, and click on the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage. Uh, you can use a debit or credit card to make your tithe electronically there, or you can mail a check or money order to our address, 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him more to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns. Um, only two new ones this week, um, and well, one new one. Um, Dominic uh, got a COVID-19 test, which he was negative for, in preparation for his upcoming surgery. Uh, we continue to pray for a successful surgery in the um, early this week. Um, we also pray for, um, I'm asking for prayer for healing over this, uh, upper respiratory infection I have. Um, I'm also, we're, we are also asking for prayer for, um, Sheila Inman, I believe is her name. Um, Sarah Inman, not Sheila, excuse me. Sarah Inman and her family. Um, uh, Miss Inman lost her, um, uh, daughter this week. Um, so uh, Miss Inman formerly owned um, Tudor U Daycare here in Whitehall. And um, I know the uh, family used to participate with uh, MK Studios Dance uh, Studio. Um, uh, they moved to Hot Spring Springs recently and uh, they lost their daughter this week. So you want to continue to keep Sarah Inman and her family in our prayers. <coughs> Excuse me. I am COVID negative, by the way. I did take COVID test this week, so um, no worries there. Um, so I ask for prayer as well. Um, let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask for healing for Dominic Munn and myself. We ask for um, your comfort and healing for Sarah Inman and her family um, during this time of great loss. We ask that you be with those who are recovering from COVID-19. We ask that you provide protection for those who are in its path. And we ask for comfort and, and care to those families who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. We also continue to ask for a speedy delivery of the vaccine to those who are able to receive it. And a willing heart for those who are, who's, uh, it's time for them to be able to get the vaccine. Um, we also continue to ask for reconciliation of, of our world and our nation to you and your will, oh Lord. Give us hope that we as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, uh, <clears throat> rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.